what we are here to do today, as John said, is to celebrate the acceptance of a painting um, to the society, gifted to the society, previously unknown to scholarly discussion. Um, in a sense, I'm very much aware that what I'm doing here is assembling the information towards a catalogue entry, one day perhaps to join as a supplement our great picture catalogue which we published a few years ago. It takes us into the worlds of 18th century biography, of the attribution of pictures, and the histories of place concerned with uh, where the sitter of this portrait, Charles Marsh, lived, and contemporary debates about antiquities, and in particular one very famous object, the Barberini Portland vase. Who was Charles Marsh? What do we know about him? Um, he lived from 1735 to 1812. He has a very small entry um, in the Oxford um, Dictionary of National Biography, um, appended to the end of a longer entry on a, another more famous Charles Marsh of his period. We know that Charles Marsh was the son of a London bookseller, that he went to Westminster School in 1748 at the age of 13. He graduated from Trinity Cambridge in 1757 and uh, as a senior classical medalist and was a fellow of Trinity in 1758. Thereafter, um, he was a clerk in the War Office in London where he served for many, many years and at his retirement, he retired on a pension of £1,000 a year, a really very large sum of money. Um, and one of the conundrums of his life is where his great wealth actually came from when you see the size of the house that he bought at Twickenham. Charles Marsh never married, um, and the thing that interests me, there are many ways of interpreting and thinking about that conundrum, particularly with this great group of 18th century scholars. Um, but what interests me about that fact is that when we look at portraits and the things people collected, we're constantly thinking about how they wish to be seen by others, what was in the word that originated in uh, Renaissance historiography, what was their self-fashioning by these things, and what was their impression of legacy. It's clear that people in that situation are not leaving large sums of money, therefore, to their immediate heirs, sons and daughters, um, and therefore they have maybe a freedom to buy, to collect, uh, to assemble things that other people do not. We don't know a lot about Charles Marsh's um, scholarship and where he got um, his keenness for classical antiquities from, uh, but um, in January 1784, um, he was elected a Fellow of the Society of Antiquaries at the time when the Society, of course, was resident at Somerset House. And for those of you who don't realise this, when you go into Somerset House, look at the door into the shop on the left, um, uh, and there over the um, entrance is the insignia of the Society, because upstairs from there were uh, rooms created for us in those apartments which the Courtauld Gallery had just recently vacated um, the picture collection whilst the institute is refurbished. Um, it's interesting that in his election to the fellowship, he had four major sponsors. It's very interesting when we look at the history of our fellows as who knew <coughs> who, because it's by those ways that we know scholarship was passed around and objects discussed. Two of those four also went to Westminster School. Uh, two went to Trinity Cambridge. One of them was the Scotsman William Roy, who was the surveyor and founder of the Ordnance Survey project. And following his election in 1776, um, Roy's book, The Military Antiquities of the Romans in North Britain, uh, was published by the society in 1793. So this may be a particular moment in the history of the antiquaries, and I'm moving, therefore, very much away, as you'll see by this lecture, from an idea of this being a portrait of the 1790s towards perhaps the 1780s, equally possible. Because at the moment, um, uh, 
Marsh was elected in January uh, 1784, uh, it was just a month later that Dean Mills died, and you see him in that drawing by Rowlandson on the um, on the right, um, uh, uh, welcoming a new fellow to the Sud. He, uh, Marsh may have been one of the last people that um, uh, Dean Mills actually admitted um, to um, to our group. We've not a lot of evidence of Marsh's involvement with the society thereafter, except that he got involved in perhaps the most famous and passionate debate um, of the 1790s in, uh, amongst the society, and that was over the election of the architect James Wyatt, who was rejected in a ballot of 1796 because so many people objected to the way he treated the restoration of our great cathedrals, including Salisbury and most famously at Durham. And then when he was put up for a re-election uh, in 1797, um, he did eventually get through. But in his diary, Joseph Farrington says that on the 6th of July, Marsh said in a low voice, it was their business to elect persons who had preserved antiquities and not such as destroyed them. Um, and, but we know that Marsh later withdrew his motion to blackball Wyatt's candidature for the second time. But that nomenclature that uh, Wyatt gets as Wyatt the destroyer in some aspects of architectural history, um, Marsh is clearly either reflecting that or may be one of the originators of that name. And of course, the evidence of the painting itself uh, refers to something very specific because of its inclusion of the Barberini Portland vase. In May 1784, just four months after his election, um, Marsh gave a paper to the Society on the elegant ornamental cameos of the Barberini vase, which was, had a preface in English, but the paper itself was in Latin. And this was printed in volume eight of our journal, Archaeologia, in 1787. And I'll come back to some of the aspects of that article and what it says about the vase later on. So I wonder if portraiture, as I've said so many times in teaching, uh, think of portraiture as the art of occasion, uh, just to get people thinking about why do you have your portraits painted in early modern times. Um, uh, if portraiture is an art occasion, then it's possible that Marsh commissioned this portrait um, in the mid-1780s um, at the time he published this article, uh, because it very much reflects that particular publication. We know that at the end of his life in 1811, uh, Marsh published a translation into Latin of Milton's uh, L'Allegro, um, and a copy um, was lodged with the Society just after his death two years after his death in 1814. In his book, uh, The Memorials of Twickenham, Parochial and Topographical, uh, published in 1872, so that's a full 60 years after Marsh's death, Richard Cobbett, the local historian of the area, who was a junior curate at St Mary's Twickenham, described Marsh as a man of literary taste, who possess a valuable library containing many rare texts. And so we might suppose that the book collecting which Marsh um, undertook may have started with his father's role as bookseller and clearly continued through his life. We need to find out more about um, that library. And that brings us, of course, since we've mentioned Twickenham, to where he lived. Well, we know of two places where he lived. He lived uh, some of his time and certainly died in his apartment here in Piccadilly. So Marsh is, in a sense, coming home by uh, coming into this building. But we also know um, uh, that in 1799, so uh, bear in mind by this time in his mid-60s, um, and more than a decade, since perhaps the publication and the uh, making of the portrait, he bought uh, Radnor House at Twickenham, a large property on the river, um, and hence the comment by the later local historian that I mentioned just now, Cobbett, in 1872. And Marsh owned this house until his death in 1812, so he lived there for 13 years. 
The house is recorded um, in this print um, after uh, a drawing by the German artist Augustin Heckel. Heckel um, came to Britain in a very interesting career. He was from Augsburg and he came to um, England in 1746 um, in his retirement and lived at Richmond. Um, and uh, in 1747, he made a print of the Battle of Culloden. So very much plunges into the immediate world of British politics and of topographical views. Um, and in this um, print, after uh, Heckel's watercolour, we see a battlemented 18th century Gothic style house. So it's very interesting that Radnor House, at mid 18th century, um, just think of, uh, I'm going to come on to it obviously, the building of Strawberry Hill and Walpole's, Horace Walpole's work there, that this Gothic style house is by the river as early as 1750. And we think that's due to the work of John Roberts, the Earl of Radnor, who owned the property um, in, from 1722 uh, through to the 1750s. That view of um, uh, Radnor House um, really has a very long life. And what I think is interesting about it is that we have to situate it in this enormous quantity and great richness of drawings, paintings, prints of this stretch of the river between Richmond and Twickenham, which became such a, uh, a keynote of British topographical history in the 18th and early 19th centuries. So there it is in a print of the 1840s, and I put alongside it a ground plan of the house, also from the 1840s, just before the moment in the mid-19th mid century when the house was given uh, a refit, and it, it thereafter looked very much like um, a mixture of Gothic house and rather Italian villa, and I've begun to wonder whether the building of Osborne in these very years isn't somehow influential on how Radnor House later um, appeared. After several 19th century um, owners of the property, the house passed to Twickenham Council, um, but sadly was obliterated by bombing during the Second World War. And here we are on the site today, and on site, what remains are, though repositioned, obviously, and changed considerably in the meantime, are two of the small summer houses by the river that we have just seen in those early prints, and we'll see them again later on. Otherwise, the site today has a flood level marking from um, the 18th century, some fragments of brick walls, but nothing otherwise remains of the house. Fortunately, um, uh, and really because of a programme of conservation of a bigger, grander sort and um, adventure than the one we're launching today to do with the Great House, um, in the 1930s, Twickenham Council were really not doing anything with the property. And um, Queen Mary um, wrote a letter to the um, mayor um, saying that uh, she would lend her support and patronage to any ambitions to um, restore this great house. So this prompted uh, a full article by Country Life in 1937. So fortunately, because Country Life went there, we have these photographs uh, at a time when there was great pressure for conservation. So what we seem to be seeing in these pictures are elaborate interiors from the Earl of uh, Radnor's time, from the mid 18th century, including there on the right, um, a painted ceiling in an upstairs long room by the French artist Jean-Francois Clermont. Now there's no evidence from these photographs to get back to Marsh uh, to say anything uh, that suggests that Marsh did anything major with the house. We know he did practically nothing with the exterior because of those plans and drawings from the mid-19th century which essentially shows the 18th century house before the refit. So very little evidence that much happened to the house after the Earl of Radnor's time until that refit a century later. So Marsh built, uh, buys a very grand house and lives there, uh, presumably, you know, with his collection. Now, the Gothic appearance of Radnor House and its proximity to Strawberry Hill inevitably 
begs the question and introduces the appearance of Horace Walpole into this lecture. Here's the 1784, very relevant to the things we're looking at today, map of Twickenham uh, by Samuel Lewis. And um, what we see here, where it's flagged as Mr. Um, Bassett's house, um, which is um, uh, just there. Um, and Strawberry Hill is just here, so they're very close, um, bringing all sorts of questions about the possible influence of this house upon Walpole's designs for um, his uh, much more celebrated mansion. <coughs> and um, we know that Sir Francis Bassett, Baron de Gunstonville and Bassett, was the most significant owner of Radnor House between the Earl's time and Marsh's time. And we know that um, he visited um, Strawberry um, Hill because we have the tickets of, um, you went as tourists to Strawberry Hill, Walpole didn't necessarily greet you there, however high and mighty you were. Um, the tickets survived from his visits to the house, uh, including some visitors that he took along several times um, during the late 1780s. Um, there's no evidence, however, that he actually encountered Walpole himself or that Walpole was um, a visitor to Radnor House. And similarly with Marsh, um, the only reference we find in Walpole's correspondence is the rather disparaging comment about the Arthur in Archaeologia in a letter from Richard French of February 1790 where he contests Marsh's interpretation of the Portland vase. And of course, by the time um, uh, Marsh bought the house in 1799, Walpole had been dead for three years. There is no one link between um, Walpole and Radnor House that's interesting and worth further exploration. Um, in the mid-1750s, the Swiss artist uh, Johann Friedrich Muntz spent seven years in England. Um, I happened to have a, uh, an opportunity to look at his work quite closely some years ago when I was working on the vine because John Shute, the, the patron of the vine in the mid 18th, an owner in the mid 18th century also employed Muntz uh, because he was a close friend of Horace Walpole. He stayed for some years with Walpole in the 1750s until Muntz happened to fall out really with the entire Walpole, Walpole circle of friends. And um, it's Muntz uh, who recorded the riverside of Radnor House. And here are those pavilions, as I showed you in the pictures on site today. Um, now, this one is closer to the original. That one is much altered. Um, on the river frontage, the house uh, up here would have been back there. And there they are in this view from the print I showed from 1750. So that. Um, business, if you're looking into the history of the house, of the connection through months of its representation um, is quite an interesting one. I suppose that um, Charles Marsh ha hung his portrait um, at his great house at, at Radnor um, because following his death, the painting has an unbroken provenance through a series of owners who all lived in Twickenham houses. It's absolutely down through the name changes because the uh, portrait would have passed through the female line several times. And it stayed along the river of Twickenham until it was gifted to the society last year. At Marsh's death in 1812, um, his heir was his nephew, the Reverend Thomas Viles. As a King Scholar and Captain of Westminster School, Marsh was entitled to burial in the Abbey. And here we find the memorial to both himself and his nephew in the East Cloister. So let's turn now to the artist, um, Lemur Francis Abbott. Um, and it's initially from the label on the back of the picture that we get um, the first hint that of Abbott's authorship. And it says, um, uh, the, most of the Charles is obliterated, but the S is there, S. Marsh Esquire, by L.F. Abbott, celebrated portraitist, 
an admirable likeness and much prized by his nephew, the Reverend Thomas Files. I don't know, it may be, that may too may be historic, but suggesting that this may have been um, uh, appended to the back of this picture between 1812 and 1831 when Viles died. Um, that's the date of this label, the date of his death. So we have some clue there, but also stylistically and by attribution down through this family line over the years. This picture has always been attributed to L.F. Abbott. And why, one wonders, this particular artist, why did um, um, uh, Marsh give him the patronage? Um, Abbott painted um, different um, sitters, sometimes interesting groups of patrons, over many years, both military and naval, naval figures, most famously his portrait of Nelson, which survives in many different versions. Um, and of course, Marsh, working in the War Office, would have known some of those people in um, military and naval life. And he, but he also painted um, scholars and scientists. And in particular, and somebody who may well be an important um, um, enabler in this scenario is um, Sir William Musgrave, whom Abbott certainly painted. That's the version on there on the right in the British Museum, in the, uh, the British Library. And of course, Musgrave is very important in our history because um, he, uh, through his extraordinary manuscripts and manuscript collection, which are now in the British Library, he enabled James Granger in 1769-74, and later Henry Bromley in 1793, to publish their great compendiums of engravings expressing the history of British portraiture. Um, and of course, uh, this is something which is referred to in the print under his elbow, much like Marsh has um, his elbow on, or very close to the Portland bars in his picture. So um, the and what's also important here is that Musgrave was a vice president of this society in the mid 1780s, just at the time when Marsh's when Marsh's article was published, and when um, he will have been a familiar in the society's premises. So there may be um, a connection there. When I uh, it seems to me when I look at the works of um, uh, L. F. Abbott. Um, that uh, he paints in rather different ways and in different means of, of production. And of course, we'll find out a lot more when we get the picture restored as to what, this, what category this falls into, as he turns from different sitters, as he turns to different groups of uh, patrons, as well as through the time span of his life. It did seem to me, just looking a couple of weeks ago, one more time, at the five pictures by Abbott currently on the walls of the National Portrait Gallery, that the um, pottery manufacturer Thomas Turner there on the left has a kind of, when I looked at it, I thought that has a kind of uh, brightness, if I may say a blondness of the skin tone and everything, that may be the sort of thing we're going to get um, when um, Abbott, um, sorry, when the Abbott portrait of Marsh is restored. That portrait dates from about 1790. Um, but one commission in particular by Abbott links the painter's life, um, uh, his uh, illness and his death, Abbott's illness and death, with his practice. Because there on the right is his portrait in the MPG of the sculptor Joseph Nolkins, painted about 1797. In 1798, um, Abbott was certified as insane four years before his death in 1802. Um, but he makes his will in 1800, refers to his dear wife, not necessarily committed to an asylum, uh, one wonders, but maybe kept um, with his family until that death. And then in, on the 18th of August, 1803, um, the year after um, Abbott has died, um, Joseph Farringdon is in uh, the sculptor Nolkin's studio, and he writes... A boy near 16 years of age was drawing upon slate from a plaster figure. 
Nolkens told me he was the only son of the late Mr. Abbott, portrait painter. His mother is a Roman Catholic and a bigot. So that's the dear wife from another family perspective, uh, wherever um, Nolkens uh, and, and Farringdon heard this from. She insists upon her son making a, a Romish priest, which he refuses, and she will in consequence scarcely see him. He lives with her father and mother, who allow him to pursue his inclination for the art. Just an interesting sideline that somebody writes like that. We're exactly halfway between the Gordon riots and the Catholic Emancipation Act. Um, so it's quite interesting that somebody makes that comment um, at that time. What about the style of the painter? Um, um, and just some general and more specific comments that I would make about this. Um, Marsh is shown um, as the scholar in his coat. Often said that um, uh, people wore these, from the uh, quite early times onward, wore these coats, often lined with fur, in the mornings when they're at their scholarly and thinking activities. Um, I certainly think, because I'm obviously making a push here for the presence and the power of this portrait um, that we are uh, accepting and that we want to conserve, with the presence in some of the great um, subjects of the Renaissance. Um, and that sense in the Lotto and Titian portraits of the sitter showing you, to go back to self-fashioning, the sense of where he wants to belong, what he's interested in in the um, two on the right by the collections that they have uh, with Marsh, his scholarship around the uh, Barberini Portland Vars. And that interesting use of fur, and I was asking one or two of our scholars here today um, what they um, thought it was, um, and we concluded it's probably fox um, that um, is the lining to Marsh's coat. Um, sometimes the wearing of fur in the 18th century was a sign of having travelled, um, particularly if foreign furs are used, um, though the most common lining for these coats was fox or sometimes squirrel fur. And I put up three batonies here to remind us of the, uh, how common this kind of dress was, three of uh, Batoni's Roman por portraits painted in Roman English sitters. Um, and one thinks, too, of the use of, uh, in two other ways, of caps, um, whether it's the extremity in terms of portrait type of Rousseau in his um, our so-called Armenian costume, where hat and dressings of the coat are uh, um, of fur, or, of course, the lining of Hogarth's um, cap in his self-portrait. The 1780s um, was a particularly, apparently, um, a great fashion for fur ruffs. This is Siddons by Gainsborough in the National Gallery. And Prince George himself had muffs in the 1780s made of sable. Um, so expensive things. And just looking again today, you think something else, but that turning back of the sleeve, it's almost as if um, Marsh in his portrait has um, has the makings of a, a muff there in which, into which he can put his hands. One of the most engaging of Batoni's images of this kind, there on the right, is of Thomas Kerridge, and I can't but mention him in this particular room. Painted in Rome as a young man, because of course Thomas Kerridge was the donor of 28 paintings to the Society of Antiquaries through his will in 1828, and many of them are in this room today. Um, our arch top portrait, some of which are on the, their way back from the Paston Treasure Exhibition in America and at Norwich, but two are back up there, Edward IV and Richard III. Um, the uh, portrait by Anthony Samor of Jan van Scorrell, his master on the back wall, and of course, most importantly, our great portrait by Hans Ewerth of Queen Mary I over the fireplace. So it's very interesting that um, we see this connection through fur between these uh, fellows of the society uh, and between their giving and commenting on things that were here. What then about the painting's content? And here we enter this um, 
mine of information and an enormous amount of scholarship which I've only just begin, have begun to um, uh, delve into. The vase in this picture, um, a very well-known history, um, and as you can see by showing the detail of the Marsh portrait and the vase itself, and of course it's in reverse, um, and I'll come back to the issues around that in a moment. But to recap, um, because the possibility of when Marsh might have seen this vase, how he knew it, um, is very interesting in this recorded history. The um, uh, Barberini Portland vase is first recorded about 1600. It's owned by the Barberini family for 150 years until it was sold to the Scottish dealer, James Byers. And somewhere on its way home um, between Italy and London, it was purchased by Sir William Hamilton. And when he comes on leave to London in 1783, he negotiates, or begins his negotiation with the Duchess of Portland for her purchase of the vase and other items. Um, so it's always been supposed that Sir William Hamilton purchased the vase um, uh, really for onward sale. The Duchess of Portland was described by Horace Walpole in his usual waspish manner as a simple woman, but perfectly sober and intoxicated only by empty vases. <laughs> the sale um, of the vase from Hamilton to um, the Duchess of Portland took place in January 1784, the very month that Marsh was elected. Um, and two months after Marsh's election as fellow, in March 1784, Sir William Hamilton brought the vase to the Society of Antiquaries in Somerset House um, to show it. So the presentation of the vase on public show, as it were, to the fellows of the Society is exactly midway between Marsh's election and uh, the um, point where he gives the paper to the Society in man. So one says, surely therefore, um, Mars um, must have seen the original. And there, as we go back to the page of the entry in Archaeologia on the article and, and the vase itself, Mars must have seen the original. Um, in the painting, um, uh, Mars positions himself among the scholars who have debated and contested over the content of this vase and the meaning of its figures. Throughout the 18th century, the vase was believed to have originated in Rome on the Monte del Grano uh, from the tomb of the mid third century Emperor Alexander Severus, um, and its tomb of uh, Alexander Severus and of his mother, Julia Mamea. It's interested, uh, sorry, it's illustrated as such by um, Pietro Santo Bartoli in his Gli Antichi. Sepulchre of 1697, um, and here are a couple of, uh, uh, more than a couple of plates from that, both of the tomb and of the um, vase itself. Um, it was later, uh, of course, um, uh, put into print also by uh, Piranese in his Antiquita Romana of 1756. But it's particularly with the great scholar Bernard de Montfaucon that um, Marsh wishes to contest. Uh, Montfaucon is, as we all know, a great scholar, a great um, person who lived between the 17th and the early 18th century. His uh, L'Antiquité um, Explique, there, which you see the uh, fifth volume, um, is uh, it's, a, it's a tremendously uh, valuable and powerful work of a compendium of um, relics of antiquity. And, uh, but of course it is that that um, Marsh seems to contest with. Here are three details of the painting and I put, as you see it at the bottom there on the right, face on, and I've turned it round up there. Uh, Montfaucon's um, uh, volume five, which I've shown the title page just then, Les funérailles des nations barbares, des lampes, les, des sulpices. Um, uh, that's what he chooses to put in the picture. Uh, 
Montfaucon, who never saw the vase, um, believed that the uh, vase was made of agate, and that's a very obvious thing to contest and to um, uh, prove that it's not. It's glass uh, when the vase finally comes to England. Much of the debate uh, through history has been about whether the content of this vase is something to do with the story of Peleus and Thetis. And Thetis. Um, Frank Marsh's summary of what he believes this vase is about doesn't have a typed icono iconographic program at all. He describes it as scattered features of well-known history satirically sketched out. So he is the only person, for example, who identifies one of the figures on the vase as the adopted father of Alexander Severus, the Emperor Heliogabalus. Nobody else agrees with that. Um, so it, it, it's quite interesting that there is this huge speculation around what all these um, figures um, actually mean. Of course, all the um, representations of the bars show the figures in the printer, the common printed form. You make the drawing, and then the print is in reverse. This must have been the currency of the knowledge of this vase throughout the 18th century in England up until 1784 when it arrives, or 1783 to 4, when it arrives in Hamilton's possession. Um, uh, what's very interesting is that um, it is, um, it is uh, in Hamilton's own engravings of the bars that we see for the first time an engraving the right way round. Uh, where he's actually representing the vase itself rather than simply its figures. Um, but Marsh seems to take his cue from Bartoli in um, showing this um, uh, image um, the, um, in reverse from the print culture, as we see um, when we go back to comparing the detail of the, of the vase and the painting of Marsh um, there on the left. Finally, let me turn to um, the condition of the painting and what we know about it from its physical appearance. And I'm very much indebted here, um, and I'm just briefly resuming the work of our picture conservators who have um, looked at this and done a, a kind of preview of what might happen to it. The picture, as is very obvious when you go and look at it closely, and I hope you all will at the end of the lecture, is unlined. It's over a four-membered pine stretcher. It's very stiff and undulating. Uh, and there are patches to hold the tears or holes at the top left and the bottom left, which you can see um, on the back. Um, the paint is in adequately good condition, we're assured. Um, but it's very discoloured by the varnish, and there's quite a lot of surface dirt. But of course, when you throw the good camera at these things, and the light brings them up. You can see how splendid this could look. And there is something there, because that looks brighter than the face you'll see it in the picture, that we, um, uh, as you will see later on. But um, when I talked about that brightness and blondness in the, um, uh, in the picture in the MPG, something of that, I think, may come up in the cleaning of this, of this work. And there are some further details of the fur and this um, training of paint across the top of the surface to get highlights and to get the characteristics of the different colorations um, of this material. And the frame. The frame profile is in pine. Its surface decoration is created with gesso. And the face of the frame is oil and water gilded. And we're advised that that is not the original decorative scheme. It's been tampered with. And what we see today is probably a campaign of the 1860s to restore, or to restore it. Um, what did the original scheme of this um, frame look like? One very interesting thing emerges, though, uh, that brings us back to Charles Marsh and uh, the origins, perhaps, of this frame and its making. Charles Marsh's sister Anne married Amos Viles, and they are the parents of the Reverend Thomas Viles, whom we saw is commemorated 
with um, Charles in Westminster Abbey and to whom Marsh leaves his estate. Amos Viles' elder brother was the frame maker Thomas Viles um, and it was his workshop that was responsible for the frames around the two portraits of Sir Joshua Reynolds and Sir William Chambers in the Royal Academy next door. Uh, Thomas Viles, the frame maker, died in 1781, leaving his business to his niece, Sarah. So, I'm not sure yet whether that Sarah is the Reverend Thomas Viles, buried with Charles Marsh's sister, or maybe the daughter of some other brother of Amos and the elder Thomas. But what's quite intriguing, what I'd like to follow and think about, is did Sarah, well, because we know she then managed um, uh, her uncle's business, did she manage the making of this frame for her uncle or certainly close relative, Charles Marsh, uh, when his portrait was, was made during the 1780s, the first decade of her um, of her managing this business. So an interesting um, place there to uh, think of, begin to think about the making of this frame. Only the technical analysis when the frame is removed, the picture is removed and we examine the frame very carefully and compare it with other Viles' um, uh, work. And of course, as some of you in this room will know, we're very much indebted to Jacob Simon's work on frame makers, wonderful database there on the National Portrait Gallery website, um, is that we can start to do some technical analysis and indeed um, comparison. To end, I just want to say that I think this portrait um, is and um, will have um, uh, a tremendously significant place in our collection of 18th century portraits. Uh, we've already speculated about various places where it could hang um, in its splendour when it is restored. Um, I think it will, I think it outshines, uh, though they're very important members of the society, the four portraits on our stairs are not as good in terms of quality um, as this portrait. Um, I think it's a greater work, as it were, even than our wonderful portrait of um, Martin Fuchs, the last purchase of a historic portrait by the Society in the early 90s here, just to the right of the screen. Um, it sits alongside the portrait of um, Humphrey Wanley, I think, in terms of its interest. And how interesting there that we almost see a kind of difference through the 18th century of someone, a portrait painted with a man surrounded by a rather complex narrative on his interests in the translation of texts and his... Um, and his involvement with classicism, whereas the portrait of Marsh is done by a very straightforward but very integrated reference by just one object into what the man knew and believed in. And alongside, of course, our Gainsborough's, I just put up Mr. Minette there, Mr. and Mrs. Minette, which hang up in our library. Um, we'll be able to, I think, um, judge and see the quality of that um, when the picture is restored. So this is the beginning of our fundraising campaign for this. We already have some funds behind us, so we are fully confident we can get there. Um, I want to thank uh, um, many people for the help I've had so far in doing some examination of this portrait, um, uh, to all the staff at the Antiquaries, but particularly to Heather Rowland and Dominic Wallace for their help in making this occasion possible. I want to thank the local historians and particularly the librarians of Twickenham and Richmond um, who were very helpful to me. I want to thank the local historian of Twickenham, um, Mike Cherry, for his recent book on Radnor House and the scholars Michael Snowden and Lucy Peltz in particular who um, have seen the picture um, in recent times and given me good advice on what to start looking for. But finally, I want to thank um, the donor of this portrait, Sheila Lockhart, who's with us here today, and to say that this portrait will finally hang on the walls um, in memory of her brother, Simon, who died a couple of years ago, who was the last um, um, owner of this um, portrait, and who I think had, um, uh, he lived, would have been um, uh, a great scholar and certainly a fellow of this society. Sadly, that did not happen. 
Um, so um, it's to them that I want to make the greatest vote of thanks today, and also to thank all of you for coming in to um, listen to what I have to say. Thank you.